Well, good morning. We are glad that you're here for worship today, and uh, we are ready to get started. I do have uh, an announcement for you. Today's, a, as you know, is a rainy day, and we have been talking and pumping up for the last uh, three weeks, uh, an excursion as a church. We are going to go out on one of Dan's boats, and uh, we are going to see the lighthouses, perhaps fish, just enjoy the weather. And, well, that's a lot harder to do when it's raining, so we're going to postpone that. And uh, we're going to push that back uh, a few weeks. Probably August 8th is the last thing uh, Dan and I were talking about. And so um, if you would like to join us for that, feel free. And weather permitting, we will do this at a later time. Um, and, but I am glad that you're here today. Uh, this is a day where we worship our Lord and we uh, honor Him and uh, celebrate what He's going to uh, do in our life and what He is doing. Uh, our call to worship uh, opens with kind of this lament at eh, just what's wrong with the world. It's almost like uh, David was watching too much of the news or something. And, uh, and so you'll hear that. When you hear the psalm, you're like, oh man, that's really kind of a, a negative psalm. But he ends with kind of a hope, uh, a kind of expectation for what God might do despite what he sees around him. And it's my hope that as we come to worship this morning, that uh, we would be able to trust in God and look to what He is going to be able to do, no matter what it is that we might have come to worship with on our mind, what fears or concerns that we might have. Let us turn our trust and our hope to Him. Let's hear the call to worship and honor Him this morning. Our call to worship is Psalm 53. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone is turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on God, but, where, but there they are, overwhelmed with dread, where there was nothing to dread. God scattered the bones of those who attacked you. You put them to shame, for God despised them. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When God restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. If you stand with me, we'll worship together in song. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Amen. 
Father, we uh, come here this morning to worship You, indeed to honor You. And Heavenly Father, I can't help but think how this day was a day that uh, we had planned for a while as a, as a church event following this service, that we had planned for a while that uh, this day would be a, a special, unique, and exciting time uh, gathering together as a church. And uh, Lord, uh, we have been interrupted by, uh, by the weather and it reminds me that uh, our life often has these kinds of interruptions where we have uh, a plan or an outlook or we have an idea of where things are going to go or how things are going to play out. And even things that we think uh, uh, would be good, would be helpful, uh, might, might be something that uh, is pleasing before your eyes. And yet, Lord, uh, things don't always go that way. Something else gets in the way. And Heavenly Father... Today we come to you acknowledging that wherever we are, whatever interruptions come our way, Heavenly Father, help us to be faithful to you. Help us uh, in all that to see that uh, uh, our lives can still be directed towards you and you are the God who will still work and help us in the midst of those surprises and those shocks and things that come our way. And so, Heavenly Father, today we lift those up to you as well. That, Lord, if, if there is something that has come as a particular burden or concern uh, to anyone here or watching, that, Lord, uh, we would know that we can lift it up to you with sure trust that you are the God who is with us. Today, we do want to honor you. We want to take a break from looking at uh, what is wrong around us or what is wrong with us or, or whatever is happening. And, Lord, remember that you are the God who has a plan for us, a plan for this world, you're the God who will never leave us. And so, Lord, today, we celebrate that. We honor you and hope indeed that our lives would glorify you not only today, but in the days to come. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your many blessings. In a moment, we're going to come forward and we're going to uh, give to you. We're going to, out of the abundance of blessing that you've given us, give back in hope and trust that uh, you will multiply and extend the gift that indeed our community and our world would be, continue to be blessed. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to serve you and worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would like to uh, give today, uh, feel free to come forward and uh, place your offering uh, on the offering plate uh, at the altar rails.
Before uh, reading the first scripture lesson, I just want to remind you that uh, the scripture lessons that we read each week, uh, if you want to uh, get a kind of a preview of that, or maybe even the fuller story of that, uh, they are listed and uh, inserted in your Bible as part of the uh, intersection Bible study every um, uh, every week. And so, for instance, next Sunday, the, the Bible lessons that we'll read, the call to worship, it's all here for you. And if you want to kind of already be preparing throughout the week, each day reading a different one to kind of prepare your heart for worship, feel free to do so. What I like to do when I find that there's a gap, like for instance, oh, wait a minute, I'm only reading, you know, 15 verses in chapter 11 today, and then we're going to chapter 12 next week. Sometimes I'll just read the rest of it and find out what's the gap. But one of the things I like about kind of this process is we find ourselves going through um, the story of God. And so today, in our first scripture reading, we're going to continue hearing about the story of David and uh, how God uh, raised him up uh, to lead, the, lead his nation. This is 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, and I'll read the first 15 verses. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, and they destroyed the Ammonites, besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem, and one evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, well, she's Bathsheba, the, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. The, then David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he slept with her. And now she was purifying herself um, from her monthly uncleanness, and then she went back home, and the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. And so David sent this word to Joab, uh, Send me Uriah the Hittite. <laughs> and Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, how the war was going. And then David said to Uriah, uh, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. And David was told, Uriah did not go home. And so he asked Uriah, uh, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? And Uriah had said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife as surely as you live? I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, well, say here one more day, and tomorrow I'll send you back. And so Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. And in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw for him so he will be struck down and die. This is the first scripture lesson for today. I think we're getting a picture of what the psalm we heard earlier was looking at. Let's hear the second reading for today. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, second reading is Ephesians. Uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by the human hands, remember that at the times you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now in Christ, Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself in our peace, who have made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God's to the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. 
For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, also member of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as a co chief cornerstone, in him the whole building is joined together and raises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Amen. Amen. You can may stand together if you wish. So as I said before the scripture reading, if you want to find out, well, what happens to David after that, it's in the, this week's reading for you. It's, it's quite exciting. But one of the things I like when we do something like that and we have the different scripture lessons is sometimes they point specifically to the gospel message or the message that I'm going to be preaching from, and other times they kind of just echo back and forth from each other. So if in reading like 2 Samuel 11, you go, man, David, like that's terrible. Or we say, or if we identify in any way, like, oh man, I've done some pretty terrible things too, and I wonder why did I do something boneheaded as that. And then you read Ephesians two that Bruce read for us, and we hear about this Jesus who offers salvation and forgiveness, and we start saying, okay, okay, there's hope for us. But this passage here, we're going to find out, well, who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus that we are praising? What what can we learn about him? About what he does? And so let's look at Mark chapter six. I want to read uh, verses thirty through uh, forty four. And um, it's a familiar story, and uh, hopefully, though, we can hear something uh, a little new, something fresh. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse uh, 30 to 44. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place, and get some rest. And so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them. 
and ran on foot from all the towns, got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And by this time it was late in the day, and so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, will you give them something to eat? And they said to him, that would take almost a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Well, how many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. And Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. And they ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. This is a familiar story. I think I have heard this story preached and taught Sunday schools and sermons for a long time. We know this story. Jesus uh, starts off by, after a full day tired, exhausted. He's been teaching. We look through, through Mark already in just six chapters. There's been miracles after miracles. He's been meeting with people. People are, uh, uh, people are starting to question him. People are starting to doubt him. They're concerned. They're like, oh, I don't know. Uh, the passage, remember I said sometimes when you go home, you can realize there's a gap between uh, perhaps some passages that read. The gap between this passage in Mark and the one I preached from last week, John the Baptist is beheaded. There is all kinds of exhaustion right now. There is the exhaustion of a, of a day long gone. There's the constant uh, uh, demand on his attention. And if news has gotten to him yet, there's going to be all kinds of emotional exhaustion as well. And he says, all right, guys, it's time. Let's go. We're going to take a little retreat. We're going to go to a quiet place and we're going to eat. We're going to pray together and we're going to gather there. Go to a quiet place. Now, this is a phrase I'd heard for a long, long time about the necessity of drawing to a quiet place and having that time with Jesus, as the disciples do, to find that quiet place to draw together near to Him. And so many times, the way I've, I've, I've heard this is how, uh, as, as a way of framing and telling us how important it is, indeed, for us to have that time to reflect, to have that time to pray, to have that time to spend with Jesus, to be fed and to hear from God, and to know that Jesus is doing this with the disciples, and the disciples are going to be able to draw from Him specifically, is a great story. The way I always have heard it is that that is the ideal way to draw near to God. And I was in college, and I was speaking with um, a college student. Uh, His name was uh, Eric, interestingly enough, and uh, he was um, uh, speaking uh, with me. He was talking with me. He's like, you know, uh, pastors and evangelists and teachers have been telling me again and again, I need to go to a quiet place and have a quiet place and, and be uh, completely withdrawn to spend time with God in prayer. And he says, and I don't know about you, but I just can't focus. I just can't do it. Like, like that quiet just drives me nuts. And he was telling me this and, and going back and forth. And he says, you know, I feel close to God like when I'm, when I'm listening to Christian music or when, I'm, you know, when there's something going on in the background and I'm able to hear like the input from the, the music or whatnot and I'm able then to pray with my heart out of that. And we were having a conversation about that. And I said, oh, well, that's fine. Do that then. Like, like this drawing to be with Jesus, like Jesus is with his crowd of disciples. It isn't that uh, 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 withdrawn. And even so, you know, now the crowd is coming. I said, if you draw closer to God, listening to the music, do that. The important thing is to find those moments, right, where we get to draw close to God and allow him to feed our souls, allow him to speak to our hearts. But it is important indeed to have those moments. And so when they go to a solitary place and the disciples are just, it's just going to be them and Jesus now. They're going to leave the crowds behind. It's been a long day. They're hungry. They're exhausted. And so they get in the boat and they go. But of course, what the scripture tells us is everyone can see where they're going. (laughs) 
and the crowds start to hear, wait, Jesus is going to this other side of the lake. And now, now, the, now everyone else who maybe didn't get to see him before is like, this is our chance. We're going there. And what was supposed to be a solitary place is immediately interrupted. Immediately interrupted. And Jesus, who thought he was withdrawing with his disciples, this is going to be a time for them, this is going to be a time for drawing close to God, is interrupted by over 5,000 people. There was, there was a, I had a, a professor who was telling me a story about uh, 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 them going through seminary and them uh, getting ready for ministry and, and hearing about you know, drawing closer to God and, and seeking holiness and uh, trying to uh, be all that God wanted them to be and to give their lives totally to God, that he was practicing that kind of solitary, quiet prayer practice. And, he, and so he had said to his wife, he says, hey, I'm going to go in this room for a while, and I'm going to pray and try to be with God, and, I'm, and I just, I just want to draw closer to him. So he's telling the story. So he goes into this other room to pray, and he keeps getting interrupted. Uh, attention keeps getting called out and asked questions or kids coming in or, or whatever. He keeps, he keeps getting uh, interrupted and he's trying and, he, uh, and he's, he tried to lock himself into this place and, he, and it, it just isn't working. And finally, someone walks in to get his attention and he yells out, can't you see I'm trying to be holy? <laughs> and, and he tells this story and he realizes as he shouts that out, as he says that, he's like, what I was trying to do was the exact opposite of what it takes to be holy. In life, no matter what it is that we are trying to do, no matter what we might think is necessary for us to be our best selves, for us to, to, to be perfect or to get better or to find holiness, there will always be interruptions. There will always be others who kind of break into our space. And it's precisely in those in-breaking moments, it's precisely in those interruptions where I believe we can find the face of God. It's precisely in those interruptions that holiness has an opportunity to be exemplified. Not in just the withdrawal, not in the solitude, but in the interruptions. It is there that we find ourselves face to face with people whom God has called us to see as neighbors, as people to love as ourselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. For example, when uh, in church life, <laughs> if new people come into church, disrupt the flow of service, like, wait, what are we doing? How does this happen? What's going on? That's definitely okay, right? That is a chance for holiness to be exemplified, to see that indeed God is at work. When babies cry, like, okay, like I, I, I celebrate that. That's okay. They get to worship too, right? Outside of the church, all kinds of interruptions can come our way. And if we see the interruptions as opportunities of holiness, it can change everything. When a homeless person disrupts your meal to ask for change, when someone cuts you off in traffic, when someone wakes you up too early or too late, when the neighbor asks to borrow something, these are moments when holiness is given opportunity to flow. Moments when we are forced to remember that humanity is not found merely in my solitude. Humanity is not found merely in how much I draw within myself. In fact, uh, one of my favorite kind of uh, philosophers, theologians, Soren Kierkegaard, suggests in one of his characters, one of his books, suggests that the more which we look within, the more which we draw within ourselves, the more in which we try to say, hey, I'm trying to find meaning and draw within and draw within, the more we find, the deeper and deeper we go, the more we find there is nothing to find there. And the great irony is, the more we draw within, the more we find emptiness. And that. There has, we have to be able to look outside to an other. And I can say this as someone who is an introvert, someone who generally says, uh, you know, I get a lot of energy when I can break away into a solitary place. That humanity is found. Who we are is found precisely in how we interact with the interruptions and the people whom God puts in our life. Life is necessarily social 
and necessarily neighborly. So when Jesus is interrupted, and, and he isn't interrupted by you know, people with status, he isn't interrupted by people with influence, he isn't interrupted by people who could make his life better, no, he's interrupted by people who he says his words are like sheep without a shepherd. Now, now you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, a few years ago, there was a phrase that was kind of, kind of becoming popular. It was, it, was on, uh, it, was on, it was online. People were saying this phrase and shouting it on whatever platform they had. The phrase was sheeple, as in people are sheep. And so we call, and the phrase was, wake up, sheeple. And it was this way of yelling, of saying, hey, you're not acting with wisdom, or you're just following the status quo. Your ignorance is getting in the way of my progress, or your ignorance is getting in the way of our progress. And so it was this, this cry of, you're like sheep without a shepherd. You're people who are just following whatever you, people tell you to follow. And when Jesus sees these sheep without a shepherd, what does he do? All he wants to do is withdraw, have some time alone with his disciples. But yet this group of people have interrupted him, gotten in the way of his plan. And they are just sheep without a shepherd. He doesn't yell at them to wake up. <laughs> he doesn't uh, tell them to go away. The scripture tells us he has compassion on them and he begins to teach them. His compassion and his teaching goes so long that it is so late in the day. And the disciples finally say, look, it's time for dinner. We, we got to go. Like, people are getting hangry. Hangry is not a good thing. You know, like, they're like, you see Judas over there? Someone said when he's hangry, he'd sell his own mother for 30 pieces of silver. Like, they're just, okay, that's a Bible humor. Uh, so, uh, so they're just like, hey, they didn't really say that. Uh, so, so, like, this is, they're like, hey, this is, this is not good, Jesus. You got to get this crowd out of here. G G the disciples said to Jesus, they're hungry. Let's just let them go choose where they should go. They can find their own food. Let them go choose. And Jesus effectively says, no, you choose. Have you ever gotten a, at a point uh, where, where you're trying to figure out where to eat and you're talking to someone, hey, where do you want to eat? I don't know, where do you want to eat? Well, you pick. No, you pick. I'm just hungry. Pick something. I'll eat anywhere. You, know, you ever had that kind of, like when you start, that, that's basically what's happened. Hey, let, let, let them go pick where to eat. No, you pick. You choose. No, we don't want to do that. But the disciples also say, we can't feed them. Are you kidding me? There's a, do you know how expensive this is? They're doing like a little cost analysis, right? It's kind of cost analysis. Okay, we got 5,000 people. Man, maybe, maybe there's some unaccounted. Some people have guessed there's more if there's like uh, family members with them. There's a lot of people here. And, and, and they, they know that this is a lot of money here. Cost analysis. It's what you do when there's so much need that you don't know how to cover the cost. You say, oh, but look at this problem. Look at how many, there's thousands upon thousands of people affected by this, and I only have so much. There's a lot of people, though, that we won't feed if we spend too much time thinking about the cost. There's a lot of homelessness that won't get solved if all we ever do is think about the cost. There's a lot of problems in our communities that won't get solved if all we do is think about the costs. Lots of poor school children would never have had meals if all we did was think about the costs. And it's easy to treat moments of needs as cost-benefit analysis moments. We start you know, weighing our options. What can we really do here? Start considering all the angles. We start counting the cost. We start guarding our assets. And it's easy when we look at the massive numbers, the thousands and thousands of people who are going to need this or that thing, and say, well, we can't cover that. The cost is just too high. But Jesus doesn't let that answer stand. He will always treat those that he encounters with grace. Because you see, these people interrupted him the most inopportune time, but yet these people stepped into his space, into his life, into his area, and God has put them before him. And he's been confronted by their need. Indeed, confronted by perhaps their own ineptness. But he doesn't see their ineptitude as a reason to deny them. Even though they are sheep without a shepherd, 
He does not see these haphazard sheeple as an excuse to let them just fall into their own pits, to suffer the consequences of you know, failing to follow the correct leaders or failing to make the right decisions. He just meets their needs. More than that, Jesus says to his disciples, what do you have to offer? And they look and they say, five loaves and two fish. Well, if I can do just a little analysis of my own here, five loaves and two fish are hardly going to feed 12 disciples and Jesus. They say, this is it. This is this, this was our food. <laughs> this, is what, this is what we had scrapped together. And you want to share this? Don't you see, uh, we have limited resources here? This, this is them looking at Jesus and saying, I don't know if you took an economics class or not, but the numbers just don't add up. But when confronted, or interrupted, by those whom God puts in our life in need, Jesus asks us to give what we can. And sometimes there isn't much, but God in this story is shown to be able to multiply it and to do so much more with whatever we are willing to give over to Jesus. And God is able to multiply that. He is able to multiply what little we have left. He has, he's able to multiply what little we might have left in the tank. Because these are people who don't just only have five loaves and fish. These are people who are just exhausted and done with the day. What little that we might have. When God places someone in their life, He says, I am able to multiply it. This is what God had done for us. This is what God has done for us. When we needed Him, when we were in the greatest need, God has been able to help us in those moments. And this means, on the one hand, that we have the very promise that we can draw near to God wherever we are, wherever we have been, whatever we are going through, and know that God always has time for us. God always opens His arms for us and always will meet us. And that we also, as God looks at us, and Jesus says, well, what do you have when faced with real need in your world? When faced with the opportunity to love your neighbor as yourself, what little do you still have? And, and trust that God might be able to multiply it, to do immeasurably more than we can ever ask and imagine. This is what he does when he breaks bread with the people. And when he breaks the bread, I cannot help but imagine the kind of symbolism, the, the language that is used whenever we have communion. That we are remembering that it is indeed God's grace that is extended and multiplied and shared with us. <coughs> and so we, as followers of God, as recipients of the grace of Jesus, Jesus sends out into our world. And yes, as we draw closer to God and find moments to listen, to try find moments to say, well, who else, who, who am I? To find moments of, okay, God, how are you going to, uh, to, to help in the, in the needs or the areas that I have questions in? That we might find in those moments, God helps us reveal exactly who we are called to be and how he wants us to live precisely among the people that he puts before us in our life. And we are invited to share grace and love that our God has lavished upon us with whatever God has given us and trust that it was all God's to use and multiply as he would see fit. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, today I thank you for an opportunity to come and hear this word. To hear indeed that you are the God who does miracles when it seems there's nothing left. That you are the God who meets us where the needs are. And Heavenly Father, where you have been close to us, where you have blessed us, where perhaps we have experienced a taste of your grace, that we are to find that indeed this grace is not something to be hoarded, but you are the God who has continued to show us. Bring before us lives and people who could receive an example of your love through our generosity, through our love, 
to our sacrifices. And Heavenly Father, it is my hope and it is my prayer that we would continue to see the individuals and the big numbers of people around us as ones who are loved by you, as ones who are invited to the table of your grace. Thank you again for this day. Help us indeed this week to draw close to you, to find ourselves nourished by your Holy Spirit. And Heavenly Father, would you help us indeed to be gracious, to be your ministers, to be agents of your love, to whomever you put in our way, to whomever you bring before us. And we pray all this now in Jesus' name. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, in our bulletin it says, uh, Service of Holy Communion. Uh, we will begin, just so you know, uh, I want to let you know as a church, we'll begin having communion every week starting in August, just like we used to have. So that's a holdover from uh, last week's service. Uh, this closing song is Oceans. It's a song that reminds us about God's grace, uh, God's grace that um, knows no borders and uh, doesn't draw lines in the sand. It doesn't say, oh, you were late to the party or uh, the crowd's too big. It says God's grace is there. I thought it would be kind of funny to sing it knowing we were going out on the ocean, but uh, that will be on the 8th. But it is, it is particularly fitting today as well. Let's sing this as our closing. Amen. Please stand together. Thank you, Lord. Bring us through this coming week. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may
and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my My hope is that we will find that as we draw near to Him, we find indeed that He keeps our head above the waters, that He is with us when we take that time to spend with our Lord Jesus Christ. It is my hope also that we will find that in that time, God directs us and points us and shows us that what we have is precisely what He is able to use. Trust what God is doing in your life and go in His grace, letting Him use you. Amen.